Hello. I hope you've all had a chance to get uh, some refreshments, some cookies or coffee. We're going to get started. It's a nice group here today. I'm going to introduce a speaker you who've probably seen before here at the Senior Center. This is Betsy, D Betsy Dyer, and she is going to share some history of the Boston Post cane, a little bit about why we're here today, and then we'll share with you who those recipients are. Thanks, Betsy. Yes. Hello. Um, I am going to tell you how the Boston Co Post cane tradition began. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the post cane itself, which we have here in a special box. So you can come up afterwards and look at it if you want. It's also on display in Town Hall. Then I'm going to say one or two sentences about each of the recipients since 1909, but there's been about 25 of them, so I'm not gonna be able to do them justice. I'm gonna have to make some, some generalizations and sweeping statements. It's not right to sum up someone's life in one sentence, but I'll need to do that. Then I'll tell you about a little controversy that happened about the post cane in the 1920s. Lasted for us maybe all the way to 1930 for some reason. Couldn't quite figure out what the problem was, but you'll see. Then, tell you about some more post cane recipients. And then a little confusion down at Town Hall um, as to what they were and were not doing with the post cane. Um, and then I'll tell you about a really interesting woman, I wish I could give you way more than one or two sentences about her, um, who did not get the post cane, and that seemed to be a bit, tiny bit controversial. And then I'll tell you about the final post cane recipients before the tradition stopped abruptly, it seems abrupt to me, and then I'll tell you how we revived it. And Carl West, whom many of you knew, is going to play a big part in that. All right, so it begins with Edward Grosier, who was the owner and publisher of the Boston Post newspaper. That's where the name Boston Post Cane comes from. And he was a great promoter because there were many, many newspapers in those days in Boston, and he had to really push to get his subscription up. And so he ran all kinds of contests. Um, prettiest teenager in town who was going to be a movie star, you know, oldest this, youngest this, nicest baby, whatever. And he had recently, just before 1909, run a contest that you could submit to oldest couple in New England. You, you, he wasn't going and looking for them. They would send in an application and they would get a, rocking, a pair of rocking chairs. So that was his latest <laughs> idea. And imagine he had a pretty good readership around that because people were eager to see who won the rocking chairs and, and what the next contest was gonna be. So he came up with the idea of making a beautiful cane. It's ebony wood, it's a gold head, gold leaf, but I think it's a thick gold leaf engraved at the top that you can come up and look at um, afterwards. Um, for each of 700 towns in New England. Now, not cities, so Boston doesn't have one. I think he thought it was going to be logistically difficult to, um, <laughs> I'm really happy to see somebody, um, logistically difficult um, to deal with Boston, who's the oldest person in Boston, or who's the oldest person in Providence or Hartford, but for every town, and then for some reason not Connecticut and Vermont, and there's no explanation for why, but 700 of these canes, all engraved with individual towns' names, to be awarded to the oldest registered male voter, but mind you, there were no female voters in 1909, um, and it was to be awarded by the selectmen. And we actually still have a letter to the Walpole selectmen to do this. Every town got one. So there's 700 towns that, many of whom still have their post cane. And so that's how this post cane arrived to Walpole. And now I begin with my one or two sentences about each recipient, but I'm gonna start with something that Steve Avellino, you know Steve Avellino, who's our trainer upstairs, if you haven't met him, already, He's, he has a hypothesis that if you were farmers, or if you even farmed a little bit as a teenager, 
maybe you didn't farm for much, much longer than your teenage years or your 20s, then you have a certain kind of posture and strength and carriage that is going to carry you well into your old age. He also said that if you can't be a farmer, don't be sedentary. Okay, this is gonna be a lesson that we're gonna learn from all of these folks that I got here in my hand. Don't be sedentary. You're not gonna see any executives sitting in an office chair on my list. They're all hard, hard workers, and some of them actually said so in the newspaper when they got the cane. I worked hard all my life, and they didn't mean sitting on their duffs. So the first three are farmers. Now, this is Walpole becoming more and more industrial, so after a while it's impossible to just farm. So, so we have people who are part-time farmers later, but these are farmers. First one, Addison Page, I'm gonna say that he was known for butchering as many as 100 hogs in one season. That's what he chose to put in the newspaper about himself when he got the cane, so must have been pretty important. I'm gonna, um, anyone that you recognize the family name of and you wanna hear more about them, come up and tell me, I can find out more about any of these people, all right? So Addison Page. Henry Shearer, another farmer. Henry Acorn, both a Civil War vet and a farmer. And if you wanna read more about him, we have a wonderful book at the Historical Society of all the Civil War vets in town, and he's definitely got a chapter on himself. And then after those first three, there was a controversy starting in 1920, which was when um, Acorn got his cane, about whether to include women. Why? Because women had just won the right to vote. So the topic came up. Now, here's the various things that women around New England said about that, okay? Quite a few said, yeah, of course we should have, we should be, um, getting the cane if we deserve it, if we're the oldest person. And of course we should be getting the cane. So okay, that's pretty obvious, right? But then I, I kind of like these other ones. Some women said, no, that's a ridiculous custom invented by a man for other men, and I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> and it's not that crazy a thing to say once you, okay, do you wanna be walking around with this cane conspicuously? Because some other women said, I'm not gonna go around announcing my age just so I can walk with a cane, <laughs> right? Logical. And other women said, I don't wanna carry around an advertisement for a Boston newspaper that I don't even read, because that's what this is. If the, the head of the cane clearly says this is about the Boston Post. So very logical, isn't it? Et cetera, et cetera. Now, I tried to find out whether any women from Walpole had this sort of thing to say. Nothing was reported in the newspaper. This is bigger newspapers reporting generally the feeling of women around New England about it. In any case, for 10 years, we did not give anyone the post cane from 1920 to 1930. I don't know if it's connected or not. I don't know if it was like, gee, we just can't figure this out. Women, I don't know. But we didn't give it out for 10 years. All right, then the next awardees begin in 1930. And I'm gonna say about them, here and there there were part-time farmers because it was still rural. You might still have some, some cows out back or a huge garden or something. But for the most part, these were hard workers working in the mills, doing manual type labor. Many of them were recent immigrants. Again, I'm not gonna do justice as to exactly who was a recent immigrant, but let's say they were arriving to Walpole and not immediately getting an executive's job. So we're talking about people who worked hard. And the first one was, this is in 1930, was Peter Porter, sorry, Porter Boyden, who built many houses in Walpole, including the funeral home that's now owned by the Thomases. It used to be Keeling Tracy, okay? Built it, so that's the style of building he would do. And his own house is still standing. It's at 119 Common Street, is Porter Boyden's own house. I say that because you might drive by it every time you come here. Then, I have a little surprise. Um, I was surprised a few minutes ago. Um, Alice Garusso was here and said, I think I remember one of these people. And, I, and, and she described them and I said, is that Samuel Hannaford? She said, yep. Well, okay, you're remembering someone from back in the 1930s, very good. Um, 
because I thought maybe people would start remembering people as I approached into the 50s and 60s and 70s. No, we already have somebody recognizing Samuel Hannaford, who worked at a tannery just down the street from the Council on Aging, just where the bend goes. Then we have John McDavid, a building contractor. We have George Kingsbury, a tree warden. We have Edmund Gay, who was an iron molder at the Plimptonville Foundry. We have Charles Goodwin. Uh, I didn't, he said he worked hard all his life, doing all kinds of jobs, but he also said he did not smoke and he did not drink. Um, not everyone offered that up as, as the reason that they had gotten to be so old, but Charles Goodwin did. Then we have Theodore Slafter. He's a little bit of an outlier. He was an artist whose specialty was painting nudes, which he called flesh paintings. I don't know if that was a thing to call it a flesh painting or what. Uh, yeah, kept, kept him young, yep. Then we have Henry Hildebrand. He worked at Bird and Son, and just a week before getting the cane, he had worked at a potato harvest. So he's one of our part-time or occasional farmers. Then we have David Yule, who actually was an immigrant and was a farmhand. That's all he did, he was a farmhand. Joseph Greenwood, he is the person after whom Greenwood Road, which is off of Main Street and off of Lewis Avenue, was named. He was a machinist and owner of a car shop. His car shop was pretty much right there where the head of that road is, so when they went around renaming a few roads, they named Greenwood after him. Then Patrick Broderick, um, a laborer at various mills and he died in 1959. Okay, and I'm saying that because now we get to the part where things got a little confusing down at Town Hall for some reason. Could be partly that Town Hall was moved from the original Town Hall to where it is now in 1982. So maybe some of it was that. When you're moving all the stuff from one place to another, maybe there's some things that get mislaid. Um, now, we know some of this because a former selectman, Frank Smith, and some people might recognize that name because it's fairly recent. Former selectman Frank Smith has a wonderful oral history that was put on tape before he died. And then Katie Burtwell, some of you know her because she's doing oral histories right now at the Senior Center, transcribed that tape and said, hey, Betsy, do you realize he has all kinds of things to say about the post cane? I said, okay, great. So now we get a little bit of personal commentary. And according to Frank Smith, the post cane got misplaced in a closet in the old town hall, was essentially lost for a certain number of years. And then it was Frank Smith himself who found it. And I'm not sure what the circumstances were, you know, whether they were getting ready to move or, or, or what. And then it was put for safekeeping, according to the newspaper, in a vault in, I think, Old Town Hall, called the Selectman's Vault. Maybe some people know what I'm talking about. I'm not sure where, if there's a vault there or not that's called the Selectman's Vault. Meanwhile, while all this was happening in the 1960s, a wonderful woman deserved to have the post cane, and she would have been the first woman, because I don't know if you caught that. Women can start getting the post cane back in 1920. We're already in the 1960s. Do you know demographics? What do, what, what do the demographics say about the longevity of women versus men? Yeah, okay. So meanwhile, while all this was happening down at Town Hall, in the 1960s, a wonderful woman, I wish I could tell you more about her, deserved to have the post cane and would have been first. And I actually think there was a little bit of a sort of a newspaper campaign, a subtle one, to remind people, well, she should be getting the post cane. Um, because as she got older and older, her birthday got celebrated in a grand way every single year. And it was usually a long article about it because apparently she was just a joy to be with. She was just a delight. I can't tell you how wonderful these articles were. Who am I talking about? I'm gonna give you her full name, including her maiden name, because I know that can be important. Her name is Effie Jonah. That's her, what she's usually called, Effie Jonah. But her Effie stands for Euphemia and her maiden name is McQuaig. So Effie Jonah, look her up. I mean, people couldn't get enough of her. If, she, if they had a senior center, she'd be the person you'd love seeing coming in the door, apparently, okay? So she, here, she grew up on a big farm, 
As a teenager, Effie milked 14 cows per day by hand. Yeah, upper body strength. Uh, and then after she was widowed, she did what a lot of widows had to do because there wasn't so much support in those days. She became a housekeeper for Winslow Warren. Okay, so I'm dropping a lot of names here. Yeah, but um, she lived to age 102. And every time she had a birthday, one of the older birthdays into the 90s and finally 100 and 101, 102, going strong, big long article, Gee, if only she could get the post cane. It's unfortunate it's locked up in a vault in the selectman's area. All right, so that's Effie. So much so that some people say she did get the post cane, but she didn't. All right, so then Effie died, and in the newspaper was described, there's an almost forgotten custom in town, and that is the awarding of the post cane to the oldest person. And who got it? Leroy Spear. Now that's an old Walpole family. I'm not gonna try to connect Leroy Spear every which way, but I could, all right, and some of you could too. So a wonderful old Walpole family, Leroy Spear, but a man. Okay, so they're like, okay, Effie's died, time to award it again. Okay, um, and as sometimes happens when you get older, he left town um, to go live with family in Connecticut. So he, he ended up dying in Connecticut. Okay, why am I mentioning that? Because the cane got lost in the spear house, um, either the spear house here or the spear house in Connecticut. How do we know this? Frank Smith said so. Okay, remember we have an oral history from Frank Smith. So at that point, oh, and by the way, you could imagine how that could happen, right? I mean, you're getting older, you've got this cane, it gets chucked in a closet, things happen, your family's clearing out your house. So that's actually how a lot of canes around New England have been lost. I mean, there are plenty of towns that don't even have their cane anymore. So then the selectman decided in 1985, oh no, sorry, um, so they, put, they, they, they found the cane in, 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 uh, in uh, the Spear House, and they decided that they were going to retire it back to the vault and there would be no more awarding of the cane. Okay, but that did not last very long because Frank Smith himself retired and had a wonderful testimonial dinner, was given the town seal or a copy of the town seal, and I, at first I was startled to, to hear this, but then I've sort of justified it in my mind. The cane was not being actively given out, so they decided that they would change the parameters to Oldest living former selectman. <laughs> eh, okay, all right, all right. But I've, I've had plenty of time to think about it, and I'm thinking, okay, the cane is in a vault, nobody's using it, Frank Smith was beloved, and he didn't have it for very long, okay? But they changed the parameter to oldest living former selectman. And so Frank Smith, who by the way was a former farmer, also an active conservationist, was awarded it symbolically. So that helps a little, doesn't it? It stayed in the case, so this was the first year that they were like, nobody's touching that cane, but we're essentially awarding it to you, all right? But Frank soon died. He did not have the symbolic cane for long. Um, and then after 1986, it's all women. Someone said, okay, let's just start giving this out to women. And here I'm gonna actually mention their ages because they're older, <laughs> quite a bit older. Okay, so first we have Grace Spear, S-P-E-I-R, that's not Spear, the other Spear, it's S-P-E-I-R. Um, she received the cane in 1986. She was a school teacher, um, age 100, and had the cane symbolically, right, not the actual cane, until age 106. Wow, isn't that great? So then, after she died, they had co-recipients, two women who were born on exactly the same day in 1894, April 8th, 1894. Thank you to the town clerk to figure that all out and to decide that they were going to have two different awards, and that was to Maud Allen and Gertrude Nelson. And um, again, no cane, and, and they also decided to do something, and here's where I'm gonna bring Carl West in for the first time, 
Car West was 71 years old at that time, 71. Really identified with Carl, because I just turned 69. So I think Carl was starting to think, um, you know, I think I'm becoming a senior. I didn't think it would ever happen, but age 71, and Carl wanted to get more involved with that kind of thing, not to say he wasn't involved before. And he said, you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna award pins. And we actually have pins up here. Carl got them made. We've actually got a file on where he got them made. He got a large quantity made. He even started encouraging other towns to do the same thing. We've got all the correspondence that Carl did back then at age 71. Um, so that Maud and Gertrude, the co-recipients, each got a pin. Then we have Georgie Marie Meyer, a woman, okay, age 102, um, and she had the, the, the um, her pin for two years. She died at age 104. Her, her, um, what was said about her in the newspaper is no alcohol, no coffee, no tea. All right? <laughs> but not all of them said that, so don't worry. <laughs> all right. And then we have what I think is our last recipient until now. And that's Jenny Masayoni. I'm going to spell the last name M A C A I O N E. Died in 2001 at age 107. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that was it. And if someone wants to tell me different, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Oh, someone else got it after her. All right. That's 2001. So that brings us to 22 years later. And don't worry, we're very close to announcing the two recipients. Okay, we've got the two pins, we've got two certificates. Oh, Carl had certificates made up too. Um, and we do have the post cane for people to come up, and we do have a, a question and answer and you know commentary thing that, but I want to tell you how Carl went about this. All right? So he's well remembered here at the center. Um, and some of you know that in the summer of 2022, he had a fall at home and went to a nursing home. Until then, he'd been extremely active. Actually, he was pretty active in the nursing home, I'll tell you how. Um, extremely active. I knew him because he's an excellent researcher at the Walpole Historical Society, and it's how I got to know him. And I know I'm not the only one that Carl treated this way, but he wanted to talk to me in person, and I him, of course. Phone calls, emails, and by the way, in his 90s, he mastered everything about email. He knew how to look up stuff on YouTube and send it. He knew how to send attachments. He knew how to send photos to either taken by himself or someone else. So this was not just email from him. He really mastered that technology. And after he went into the nursing home in the summer, last summer, um, I found out that he did want to have visitors. And so I started visiting him about every week, and Carl always had an assignment or project about, for me, about history. For other people, I'm sure it was something else, right? But for me, it was about history, written out in a notebook. I'd arrive to his room, he'd go, Where, where's my notebook? He'd take the notebook out, he'd leaf through pages, because I was not the only one he was doing this to. And he'd go, okay, here you are, and he'd have a list of things I needed to pursue at the Walpole Historical Society for him which was fine. I actually liked that kind of thing. And he would insist that I take notes, and he'd keep an eye on me. Now, his bed is on this level. I'm sitting down in a chair here. I'm taking notes on my lap. He couldn't quite see. He'd be like, I don't see you taking notes. I'm like, look, look, I've got a notebook. I had to bring a notebook and pen with me. I would take the notes. Sometimes he would phone me, because he kept his cell phone right next to his bed, and say, I need you to come down, because I have a list of things. I don't want to say it all over the phone. So. I put fun in quotes here. We had about as much fun in quotes as you could have being at a nursing home, and I'm not implying that there's anything fun about it. In fact, I'll get teary-eyed if I say that. All right, so, and I know he did the same to Debbie and the same to Carrie, because sometimes I'd come in and he'd go, I just got off the phone with Debbie and I told her she needs to do this, 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 and this. Um, so I know that that was happening. Oh, actually, I had two town administrators. Can I do a shout out to them? Our two, Jim, uh, in, in Patrick, Carl told me I have to get in touch with these two. So I was, no, you, you, you guys have a thing you have to do too, but I was going to say, Carl told me, make sure you get in touch with the town administrators because when you get in touch with them, things happen. Okay, okay so Jim and Patrick, okay, but they, now they're on their way to do something. Great work. 
Okay. All right. So, so I'll get to Jim and Patrick in a second. All right. Um, where am I? Okay, same to Debbie. I know because he would say, I just got off the phone with Debbie and told her she needs to plant flowers on top of a toxic waste heap. <laughs> right, Debbie? Okay. <laughs> All right. So one day Carl, s oh, that's okay. One day Carl said to me, I want you to find out why we no longer award the Boston Coast post cane in Walpole. And I was like, okay. Uh, and I want you to figure out how to get it restarted. I'm like, okay, write it down. And so over a few weeks, we plotted and planned. It was kind of exciting because we were kind of working behind the scenes. He said, first of all, you need to get in touch with Jim and Patrick because they get things done in town, okay? And then they'll get in touch with the select board. Um, and and then, then we'll get Liz. We need to get Liz involved. Liz is our town clerk because she's going to be the one that knows how old people are in town. And then, of course, he said, Carrie and Debbie. Carrie and Debbie are so organized. Whatever they need to do, they do it. We're going to have them put them on board, and this is going to happen. And then he said, I need you to go down to the Walpole Historical Society and find out where those pins and certificates are that I made up in 1997. So I found them and brought them to Carl. He was overjoyed, as you might imagine, right, to see those pins and certificates. And all that was in motion when Carl began to decline at the end of October and died at age 95. But he knew we were going to be doing this. That's why I brought some tissue. All right, so that's it. And so now Carrie's going to tell us who the... Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Carl would be so, so pleased. I first want to thank you, Betsy, for your incredible research. Always so thorough, but I know this was personal, so thank you. And also your, your dedication to really following through and making sure that we're doing this today. It was something he couldn't get done that he needed you to help finish. And I'll get Terry talking about him, too. I think we all like to have an assignment from Carl. It's special. And he'd be very pleased um, that we have his original research about this and that we have these certificates and these pins to present to our honorees. I want to thank Liz for bringing the cane here. I know that was no easy feat to bring it somewhere else, so we really appreciate having it here, and it makes this moment even more special. So in the past, we think that recipients probably would have received this at home, that they wouldn't have been expected to come to an event like this, so we're breaking a bit with tradition to reinstate it in this unique way. We identified our two recipients, our oldest male and female, through the efforts of the town clerk, which we'll revisit each year in January. We were able to contact and speak with family members of both the oldest male and oldest female residents. And we do have one of those people here with us today. So we have with us today Jeff and Jane Alpert with our honoree, Frida Alpert. Yes, you. <laughs> I'm so, we're all so glad you're here, Frida. Really makes the moment. Your son wrote a lovely biography that I want to read, okay? Frida Alpert, aged 102, lives in Walpole with her only child, Jeff Alpert, and his wife, Jane Coperwaite. She was born April 5th, 1920. She moved to Walpole in 2010 at age 90, following the death of her husband, Sid. They'd been married for 64 years. As living alone was not an option, Jeff and Jane searched for a suitable home with accommodation on the first floor for Frida. And existing homes meeting the needs were not available. And Jane, an area real estate agent, was familiar with new homes being built in Walpole. And so they were able to specify a suite for her on the first floor and it's been an ideal home for the three of them for the past 12 years. Frida is a true farmer's daughter, to your point. Her parents operated a 200-acre farm in Johnson County, Indiana, where she grew up with her younger brother. They grew corn, soybeans, and raised livestock. 
She graduated from high school in 1938 and was the first in her family to attend college. So wonderful. She majored in English at Franklin College, and she was a member of the Delta Zeta sorority. Frida Coleman and Sid Alpert were married in 1945 at Marble Collegiate Church in New York City. And following Sid's discharge from the Army Air Force later that year, they moved to the Boston area where Sid had an engineering job waiting. They made their home first in Wakefield and then in Lexington in 1952, where they resided for 58 years prior to them moving to Walpole. Frida was a highly successful real estate agent in Lexington during the 70s and 80s. Today, Frida looks forward to weekly visits from her granddaughter, great-grandson, as well as periodic visits with other family members. She's saddened by the loss of so many dear friends and relatives and misses them all very greatly. She attributes her good health and longevity, this is the part we all want to know the answer to, to discovering nutrition and the value of vitamins when she was in her 40s. She followed the recommendations of the prominent nutrition experts of the time and led her family to do the same. She takes very little medication. She's lived a healthy life, never smoking or drinking. Seems to be a common theme. Today, Frida prefers anything chocolate, especially ice cream, milkshakes, and fudge. I hope you'll all join me in honoring Frida Alpert, our oldest female resident. Right, resembles this cane, yes. yep, oh, which we don't give out perfect. anymore. <laughs> Our male recipient couldn't be here today. I have a little bit of information. John J. Crossan Jr., who will celebrate his 101st birthday this Saturday. I spoke to him and his 97-year-old wife, who've been married for 75 years. They came to Walpole by way of Hyde Park, and though no one could be here today to represent Mr. Crossan, we'll be getting his certificate and his pin to his family as quickly as we can. Bessie's asking if there's oh, any questions. Are there any comments? questions or comments? I thought Sally might be heckling me from the back when I was talking about town hall, but okay. Um, any questions or comments? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, there are a lot of Boydens in town. So the, the Boyden School, yes, it's connected. It's not Porter Boyden himself, but there are many, many Boydens to whom he was related. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Did I get anything wrong? I mean, because this is within some people's recent memory. Does anyone remember Effie Jonah? You too. Oh my good. Wait a minute. I have to give you the microphone. Which, okay. So, so we're wondering if she was in the knitting group and worked at Norwood Hospital in the 90s. You know who would know her is Mary Jones up front. She was friends with her. Is that the same Effie that I met recently? You know, Effie, Euphemia is an unusual name. So I'm being asked questions that I think I need to sort of, remember I wanted to do a whole lot more on her and then I said no, I cannot do a whole biography so I actually cannot tell you all sorts of things about whether she was a nurse or in the knitting group. Does anyone else think they know her? Oh, no, uh, do, do you happen to know Effie Jonas? Pardon? Effie, Effie oh, Jonas. Effie Jones, yeah. yeah. Did you know her? 
No, I, I've heard the name. Okay. But I don't really know. Her. All right, but anyway, any other comments or, or questions before we? You have a the house that I'm living in now is on land that Frank Smith owned, and he was two doors up from me. Oh, okay. So an, an, a neighbor of Frank Smith, and, and then you're now living on some Frank Smith land. Yes. I bet he was well known in town. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? I thought I would get more people correcting me on things, but okay. <laughs> All right. So... Uh, enjoy some coffee and tea and, and, and come up and talk to me individually if you want me to go and research somebody for you, okay? All right. Thank you.